Hong Kong has actually had special status for 200 years. It was the most spectacular deep water port on the South China Sea at the mouth of the Pearl River, the largest trade river. And it was stolen from China in a war that set the whole cities in flames. I want to talk about that just a little bit. When the British and the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the US merchants were setting up colonies and trading stations and also forcing peoples throughout Africa, throughout the Americas, throughout Asia to sign completely unequal treaties when there was any treaty at all, it was an era of aggressive slave trade, the genocide of the indigenous peoples, and during this time toward China, the British and the US and the French and the Dutch and the Spanish and the Portuguese were all anxious to trade with China. They wanted the porcelain, the silk, the tea. But capitalism by its very nature is an aggressive expansionist system that's never satisfied. It's insatiable. It drives for more. So what these merchants wanted was free access to China's market, no restrictions. And China didn't want to give access. They want to trade with payment silver and just in special trading areas. It was a feudal social structure, very highly developed. Now, Britain set up a whole industry in India to grow and cure and refine, concentrate opium. They produced tons of it, boatloads of it. It was a huge industry. This is a warehouse, top to bottom. British merchants began the sale of opium from India to China. And US merchants, they had similar warehouses and were involved in the trade of opium from Turkey. The Chinese government felt this was a very dangerous drug and they tried to prohibit it as millions and millions of people became addicted. And they first outlawed it and then when that had no impact on the merchants, they seized and burned two and a half million pounds of opium, just what was in the warehouses at that time. There were two wars fought and lost by China to try to restrict the opium trade, but they didn't have the military technology of the West. There was a, a British invasion of China with gunboats more powerful than any weapons that the Chinese empire had. And the British in a, in a block with the other imperialist powers set up a blockade of the Pearl River they sent a full-scale military expedition, naval expedition, with 44 armed steamships, heavy cannon, rockets, infantry, long-range fire, and the antiquated uh, Chinese warships were absolutely destroyed. And then the British ships sailed not only up the Pearl River, up the Zhujiang River, the Yangtze River, they occupied Shanghai, seized the tax collection barges, it literally looted entire cities. China was defeated and was forced to sign a completely unequal treaty, a whole series of unequal treaties. The US also had a whole series of completely unequal treaties that gave these merchants access to all the major port cities in China. And in fact, these treaties were really terms of surrender. China was actually forced to pay reparations for the burned opium. And these fleets of ships, US Navy, British Navy, they had riverboats that sailed a thousand miles inland, dominated also all the coastal waters. This map is very interesting if you can make it out, but it's, it shows this network going into all the rivers of China for the opium trade, a lot of other trade you didn't like the terms a merchant gave, you simply blasted the gunboats and destroyed the warehouse. That settled it. And this was well understood. The, 
There was foreign military stationed in China to back up. It was not only the warships. There were U.S. Marines on the armored warships all along the China's coast, and there were special fleets of river gunboats, the U.S. Navy. So this is something we don't study in history. U.S. Marines patrolled China's rivers a thousand miles inland, and they were there to enforce trade interests and suppress uprisings. And there were many uprisings, many. There were U.S. Marines stationed, garrisoned in Beijing, in Guangzhou, then called Canton, in Shanghai, from 1818 to 1949. That is 130 years of occupation, and you won't find it in a U.S. history book. They trained and educated a whole army of collaborators and administrators. There were Christian minister, minis missionaries who established churches. European law in all matters took precedence. This uh, pompous military officers of all the imperialist countries gathered together, it's like a group photo, shows they operated as one in this theft. Now, China called this a century of humiliation. Hong Kong, that Britain's deep water port, military and naval base, its warehouses, was a base of operations for this entire imperialist domination. Now, the Chinese Revolution, yeah, there we go, uh, was one of the biggest upheavals in history. The standing of the Chinese Communist Party is based in no small part on its ability over the past 70 years to break with the humiliations, chaos, and constant war, the famines caused by past gunboat diplomacy, the decades of occupation by numerous foreign troops, the harsh and unequal treaties. The new communist government intention was to ensure stable development, broad prosperity, while resisting foreign intervention. And this was a promise that Mao Zedong made in October 1949 while proclaiming the founding of the People's Republic of China. Mao declared the Chinese people, comprising a quarter of humanity, have now stood up. In the same talk, he warned that every day and every minute, the imperialists will try to stage a comeback. It's inevitable. It's beyond all doubt. But we will emerge in the world as a nation with an advanced culture, our national defense will be consolidated, and no imperialists will ever again be allowed to invade our land. So there was great determination, but China was also an impoverished country, war-torn, underdeveloped in every way, a peasant economy, almost no industry or infrastructure, mass illiteracy, no equal rights, enormous poverty. And that's what we want to address because this is a change today in China from massive poverty to incredible levels of development. China's growth has also been amazing and steady. There's never been a recession or a depression in 70 years. So it's a steady improvement in the standard of living. There have been many struggles over political line, over what path of economic development, many struggles internally. But the Chinese Communist Party has maintained control and steered through and kept the country unified. And it's no small accomplishment. The UN figures it's the first country that actually succeeded in ending poverty and illiteracy. Those aren't just China's figures, those are UN admission. And during this time, both Hong Kong and Taiwan were the backdoor escape routes for the warlords and the feudal lords, and the Chinese and foreign capitalists escaping the Chinese Revolution. And that both the US in Taiwan and Britain in Hong Kong provided a military and economic cover to pull these areas of China away from the revolution and use them as a, as a spear against the revolution. 